The next presentation is going to be given by Jacom uh, Brisco. He's going to tell us about the exporters, uh, VAT refund, and tax compliance. And uh, Jacom is assistant professor at the University of uh, uh, sorry at the US, at the University of uh, Tübingen in in Germany, and he has an extensive experience working with the public finance and taxation. He's one of the, the researchers who are in, in giving a lot of uh, information, research findings with SATI data. You are welcome. Presenting this project, so this is a project about VAT refunds. Uh, title is a working title, expected to be changing at some point. Um, but this is a project with Marlies, who's at uh, UNU Wider uh, in South Africa, and with Teju, who is uh, um, at UC Irvine. Um, so let's start by making sure we're all on the same page, and we'll know what is a VAT refund. So um, VAT refund arises whenever a firm um, has a lower liability on its output than it has uh, input tax credits and thus is an owed net money from the government. There are a few ways that can happen, one of which is being VAT a destination-based tax, um, firms face 0% tax rate on um, whatever they export, but uh, they're still in the VAT system, meaning that they get to claim input tax credits, and so they sort of naturally would have, um, especially if they export a lot, they would naturally have um, negative VAT liabilities. Uh, same goes for, you know, a lot of countries have uh, goods that are zero rated, even when they're sold domestically, in which case the story is very similar, and uh, finally, <laughs> you might have years or tax periods in which you have particularly high expenses, say because of a big lumpy investment, uh, in which case that can also result uh, in a situation where your input tax credits exceed the liability on your output. Um, sort of, you can think of this as, as immediate expenses in, in, a, in a corporate income tax system. Um, all of this to say, you really, really, really cannot have a VAT system without having refunds in some way to administer refunds. So this becomes a very relevant um, aspect of VAT because, you know, you might think, okay, so we have refunds, we issue refunds. The end, except uh, if you just issue refunds, that can result in some very um, massive evasion, and here, you know, sort of the one way to think about this is that usually the amount you can evade on a tax is capped at the amount of tax you owe, right? Whereas, whereas with refunds, you know, the, the more input tax credit you claim, fraudulent input tax credit you claim, the more you can evade without any sort of natural cap. Um, you know, Majar Wasim has a paper uh, showing this, this is happening in Pakistan. Uh, I was talking to Wynona, who was helpfully providing some, some anecdotal evidence that it is happening in South Africa. But it is happening in, in sort of richer countries as well. Uh, there have been cases of carousel fraud in the, in the EU. Uh, you know, if you want to spend a fun half an hour, I suggest you Google uh, Australia TikTok VAT refunds. Uh, I assure you that is going to be entertaining, and yeah, TikTok is in the video platform where you know people upload dance videos or whatever. Um, but uh, so yeah, um, VAT refund fraud is a thing. So there are good reasons why you might want to pay special attention to firms that are claiming refunds. Um, on the other end, you know, if you never pay out these refunds, right, uh, and you just hold on to them forever and ever, and you just infinitely scrutinize these firms, then you're really giving up a bunch of efficiency aspects of VAT that usually make it favorable to, or at least in theory on the textbook, make it favorable to other consumption tax systems like, say, sales taxes um, or turnover taxes. 
Um, so that's sort of what we're, and then South Africa, you know, is a particularly interesting institutional setting, but let me not sort of uh, linger on that because the point of this study is to sort of look at, at this end of the spectrum, right? Um, and ask, okay, so clearly there are good reasons why uh, revenue agencies are going to want to you know, not go too fast with these refunds, but uh, what happens when firms experience delays to the behavior of these firms going forward? Um, and, you know, you might be thinking, so, okay, there are clearly reasons why you might expect behavioral impacts of this sort of treatment of, of VAT refunds by, by revenue agencies. Uh, and where are those concentrated? And, you know, one thing we can show you is that um, the um, value of refunds is very much concentrated among zero-rated sellers, right? Those are the sellers that usually ask for the biggest refunds. And indeed, if you look at this graph, about, you know, almost 90% of um, refund um, claims in value are claimed by sellers of zero-rated goods, either domestically or um, abroad, but these uh, refund claimers do not make up uh, even half of all refund claimers, which might, you know, might be um, telling in that uh, you might actually think that uh, the behavioral response is in fact not concentrated among, among sellers of zero-rated goods, but rather um, other firms that are claiming refunds for um, uh, other reasons like, like say, uh, lumpy investment. And indeed, we can see this, we can confirm this when we're looking at uh, sort of uh, bunching graphs or just plotting histograms of VAT liability, and here we're, we're scaling by output, but we can, and you know, we're scaling by output because exporters tend to be a lot bigger than other firms in the economy, but you know, we can show you the same graphs and they're not gonna make, tell a very different story if we're not scaling them. Um, we can see that there's quite strong bunching at zero, and this is sort of a fairly established fact in the VAT literature um, that firms would rather not claim a refund just to sort of forego the headache of um, increased audit probability, et cetera. This does not show up when we're looking at firms that you would expect to be claiming a refund, right? So if we look at exporters on the left or um, zero-rated domestic sellers on the right, uh, we don't see nearly as much bunching as we see in the graph for the total population, which is, by the way, even stronger if we look at only non-zero rated sellers. Um, why is there bunching? Well, like we said, you know, there are good reasons to expect that there is bunching, and here we can show, so we have this sort of, we actually just uh, today got access to the audit data, so you know, expect more on this, but uh, in the VAT data as we have it right now, we have this assessment variable, um, which is sort of a very broad term, as, as we understand, goes from, you know, SARS followed up with the firm again for, because there was a typo in the tax return to, uh, you know, there was a very intensive audit. But um, what we can show is that, uh, you know, there's some probability of assessment uh, depending, on, depending on what bin of VAT liability you fall in and that there's strong discontinuities at zero, right? Um, and, you know, I'm gonna come back to this uh, post pre-October 2018 thing um, at the end here, but uh, here I just want to show you, right, there's clear big jumps in the probability that you are assessed uh, if you claim a refund than if you don't. Of course, uh, there's selection here going on, right? Uh, it's not random who falls on which side of zero, uh, but given the bunching graphs, uh, you might all the more expect that uh, the same firm would expect higher audit probability if it crosses the the zero threshold. So we're currently working on a, on a cleaner causal identification, but what we have today to show you is sort of uh, mostly um, motivational evidence, mostly correlational evidence. 
Uh, so what we do here is we simply say, OK, let's say let's create a dummy variable that is 0 um, before you experience the delay and is 1 thereafter. So it becomes 1 if you are ever in the top quartile of waiting times uh, in any given year. And then look at you know, what happens to some outcomes. So what we can show, um, and then we can control for year fixed effects, firm fixed effects. We can control for other sort of uh, year vari variant um, controls. Um, but what we can show is basically after you waited a long time for a refund, you are less likely to claim refunds in the future you tend to invest less relative to your total output, uh, and you tend to have, you know, pay more VAT, or at least uh, claim less refunds. Um, so we find this, you know, very interesting motivational evidence uh, for this. Uh, one thing you might say is, well, gee, but of course it is endogenous who it is that experiences refunds, and there might be selection in this sample. What we can show you to sort of reassure you of that is, we can play the same game. It's sort of conceptually, it's sort of like a parallel trends uh, check. We can play this game in reverse, right? We can say, okay, well, if it's just selection, um, what if instead of looking backwards, meaning uh, whether you ever experience a refund, I construct a variable saying whether you will ever experience a refund in the future, right? Um, and what we can show is all the signs flip, right? All the signs flip relative to the previous table. Why? Well, because the mechanical effect here goes in the exact opposite direction, right? Uh, if you claim more refunds, it's more likely that you're eventually going to experience a delay. If you claim more refunds, it's more likely that uh, you were investing a whole lot, etc. So now let's get to sort of what we're thinking of using for causal identification. So we found that uh, in October 2018, there was a leadership change in South Africa, that in, uh, in, in, in SARS, that led to significant reductions in um, waiting times for uh, refunds in particular, for waiting times in general, you can see, but for refunds in particular. Um, and uh, we are thinking of a nice identification strategy that can exploit that variation as exogenous to firm decisions. Uh, and, you know, I already showed you the probability of assessment here. Uh, the discontinuity in probability of assessment dramatically changed between pre and post October 2018. I can show you here the waiting times, and this is in days, by the way, on the, on the uh, vertical axis. Uh, dramatically dropped uh, post October 2018. Um, what we don't see is big behavioral responses in terms of claiming refunds by firms that are claiming refunds for the first time. So what we're arguing is there's not huge selection in who is claiming a refund for the first time. Firms are just, uh, especially particularly inexperienced refund claimers, are sort of going into it thinking, well, you know, well, it turns out I have a refund, let me ask for a refund. Um, but the waiting times dramatically drop, uh, you know, almost by two thirds here, and still some uh, back and forth with stars that is going on about exactly how we're measuring what we're measuring here in terms of waiting times. But there's clearly something going on, right? Um, before uh, October 2018, we see waiting times, um, average waiting times exceeding a month. And after, we see them sort of uh, at least halving relative to that um, standard. So this is what we're planning to do. We're sort of thinking of doing uh, diff and diff pre-post first refund request. Um, and we're treated as first refund request happening after October 2018. And control group is uh, uh, um, first refund request happening before 2018. Which is going to allow us to check for parallel trends, of course. You know, um, that all still needs to happen, but uh, we're very much looking forward to that and to any of your comments. So um, what we saw here is that the value of refunds is dominated by zero-rated sellers, but uh, the behavioral effects of refunds might be concentrated among in whole, whole other parts of the economy that we see strong bunching among non-zero-rated sellers 
uh, but not among uh, zero-rated sellers, which again confirms that hypothesis. Um, and we can show some early evidence suggesting that uh, waiting a long time for a refund decreases investments um, and decreases the likelihood of claiming a refund and increases your net liability going forward. Uh, and like I said, future work is going to focus on a more causally, well-causally identified uh, strategy. So thank you very much. <laughs>